Okay, I guess we'll get started. So, my name is Alex Stamos. Um, with me, as always, is Chris Palmer. Uh, and this is a gentleman called, named Chris Ritter. And we're here to talk about uh, the security of forensic software uh, and what it means for people who are trying to catch people who commit crimes and those of you who want to get away with crimes. So, um, go ahead and introduce yourselves. <laughs> no? No? I can just yell if the mic's going to be too much. Is that right? Can you guys still hear me? That's great. Cool. So we called it Vulnerabilities and Critical Evidence Collection, and we're going to talk about some interesting stuff, um, we think. So thank you so much for, for coming and filling up this tiny room. Um, so we'll do a little introduction about the stuff we're talking about. We're going to talk about the attack surfaces and attack classes of things that are interesting in forensic software. Um, we're going to talk about some of the bug finding techniques that we've used over the last several months to find some interesting bugs in the leading uh, forensics products. Uh, we're specifically going to talk about bugs we found in the Sleuth Kit and Guidance Encase, which we believe to be the premier open source and commercial tools uh, for forensics disk analysis. Um, this is the part where we have lots of slides that we'll probably blow through pretty quickly. Um, all of the details of the bugs are contained in the paper. Um, this is the point, you know, if you guys want to ask some questions and such and get detail here, that's fine. We'll probably have to shorten this a little bit. Um, then we're going to talk about Encase Enterprise. Anybody ever hear of that product? You guys, anybody here own it and use it? Yeah, oops. So um, we'll talk about Encase Enterprise. We're going to talk about cryptographic analysis of how Encase Enterprise works and perhaps some um, things people need to think about when they use it um, and perhaps that courts need to think about when they accept that evidence. Some conclusions. And then today you're getting a two-for-one bonus talk, extra bonus talk by Chris Ritter, who's just a gentleman here. He's actually a residential fellow with the Stanford Law School Center for Internet and Society, and a, a very smart gentleman. Oh, and there's Jennifer Granick. Why don't you stand, Jennifer, and wave to everybody. Hello. We'd like to thank Jennifer for, for hooking us up with Chris, um, for putting us together. Uh, when we were doing our, our work, we thought to ourselves, what does this mean? Um, and we also wanted to be able to make sure that if any reporters ask us, um, aren't you just helping child pornographers get off that we don't have to answer that question? And so to help us figure out what this means for courts, we asked uh, Chris to, to work with us, and he'll be providing a 10 to 15 minute mini review of the state of the law as it comes to electronic evidence and how this kind of research might affect how the law has changed and how the law is, is applied to different products. So any questions before we get going? Uh, the slides are not on the disc. What's wrong with the mic? Okay, I'm getting a little too echoey. Let's see. Is that better? Okay, great. Thank you. And it's still too cold, right? Sorry. Well, we're going to heat you up with the love of learning right here. So. <laughs> okay, so uh, here we go. The slides, I'm sorry. The slides and the paper are not on the, the CD due to some fun, fun... Um, vendor notification issues that perhaps some of you read about on bug track. We'll talk about those in, at the end of the talk. Um, but they are on the web, and thank you for the segue to make me jump ahead in another slide, okay? So I'll give you the Earl in just a second. Here it is. Oh, you'll see it in just again. Okay, so introduction. So who are we? So Chris and I are researchers and consultants with a company called ISAC Partners. You may have seen some other talks today by some of our guys. Anybody here like being Brad Hill's talk, the XML, DSIG? Um, yay. yay. The VoIP talk this morning? Yeah. So um, we're doing six talks here, Isaac Partners. We're a security consultancy up in uh, San Francisco and Seattle. And uh, we're really happy to be here. And we love the Black Hat folks, so we're happy that ha they have us here. We're both working consultants. We're not full-time researchers. Uh, so the work we did part-time, it's part of our company. We have all our consultants doing research uh, when we can give them time to do so. And that helps us be better consultants, and it helps us be better researchers that we actually see bugs in the field that are real. Um, and the, the big peg here is, if you have a resume, please send it to ICE, careers at isaacpartners.com. And we'll send you a lovely auto response and perhaps a job. So um, please do that. OK, so what are we talking about? Uh, we're not forensics experts. We're not forensic examiners. We don't go around uh, catching people. But we do do some forensics to help our clients with incident response and to help them. They've had a couple. We have some clients that have had some incidents where we've tried to help them figure out what's going on and then fix the holes in their software that cause it stuff to happen. So as a result, we've been exposed to forensic software. Um, and we own uh, a legal copy of Encase uh, Forensic. Uh, and we use the free, you know, the free open source uh, sleuth kit. And we've been using them before. And we kind of realized while we were using these products, 
hmm, this is kind of interesting. These products have ridiculously hard, large attack surfaces and happen to crash at random times, which seemed to be an interesting uh, fact situation. Um, forensics people aren't security experts. Uh, and vice versa is the true, right? Uh, almost everybody, nobody in here, I think, is going to be able to match wits with Officer Bob, the computer cop, at any you know, reasonable Metro Police Department uh, to discuss the low-level file format of Outlook uh, data files or to talk about how to recover the MFT from a damaged NTFS partition. Likewise, Officer Bob has no idea how software works and has no idea how security flaws work. And I think there's kind of a, one of the things we're trying to do here is bring the security and forensics community together uh, to talk about the quality of the products that are being do, using to do the forensics um, and to help the security community get exposed to the things that our law, law enforcement officers, that lawyers and, uh, and civil defense experts, um, that all those folks are using on a day-to-day -day basis because uh, it doesn't seem to mix too much. So we had a little bit of mixing because we bought these products and we decided, hey, let's have some fun with them. And the way we had fun with them is we kind of used the standard way that people do black box penetration testing. Um, we tried a lot of fault injection. We tried looking at it with a debugger, with disassemblers, all that kind of stuff. Um, and actually, within about the first two hours, once we got the fuzzers working, we found the first bug. Um, so there's definitely some issues, and that's what we're going to discuss today. Um, we've later, through some more intense analysis, found what we think is a pretty large flaw and kind of speaks to the fact that the forensics and security people don't talk to each other because it's the kind of thing that you would hope would have been found uh, three or four years ago when that flaw was actually introduced to the marketplace. Um, so the paper and tools, as you asked, sir, are available at isecpartners.com slash blackhat. Actually, the tools package, we're going to be releasing a 16 megabyte tar of Python scripts that allow you to generate all kinds of nasty EXT2s and NTFSs and nasty PDFs and stuff like that. So we basically used a lot of the fuzzing tools that are already available from isecpartners.com, including file P, um, written by Jesse Burns. Wave, Jesse. Um, which you can go download right now. Uh, file P's actually been used by other people to find. Somebody found an OS 10 zero day using it after Jesse released it on free. So please go use our tool and find zero days in other people's products. Um, and we'll be releasing a package of tools that you can use that specifically target forensic software. Uh, and that should be hopefully up by tonight um, if we can get the website to work. So, and the paper's up there too. And we spent a whole lot more time on the paper than the tools. So please consider the paper canonical. You mean the slides? This, I'm sorry. The paper's in the slides, yes. The tools, the tools, then the paper, then the slides are way below and the amount of work that was actually spent. So please go read the paper because uh, it should be much more interesting, canonical, and has a lot more fact. Um, the slides are pretty much devoid of fact, um, as most slide decks are. So uh, what's interesting about uh, forensic software? So forensic software is absolutely ridiculous in the size of its attack surface, right? We're, you're talking about a product that is designed to take a huge chunk of data from a bad guy, and by huge I mean 100 gigabyte disk images, and it takes this 100 gigabyte disk image and it understands that the tool, like one of the commercial tools, advertises being able to read about 10 file system formats and over 270 different file formats, right? I mean, that's a huge number, 270 different, I can't even name 270 different file formats. And uh, you know, you're talking WordPerfect 1 and original Lotus 123 files, I mean, they can read anything. Um, and that's terrifying, and it should be terrifying to people that use these products. I mean, if you think about Microsoft Word, which is written by some pretty competent people and has one file format that it can open, it's had, what, half a dozen remotely exploitable buffer overflows in its parsing routines? So think about something with an attack surface two orders of magnitude larger than Microsoft Word. And you start to think about what the problem that forensic manufacturers face. Um, it, this is also interesting because these products get updated on a very, very quick schedule. And the people that write the, the filters that understand the files often have to do so from reverse engineering. They don't do it from any specs. Um, for example, NK 6.6 just came out, and one of its big selling points was it could read Office 2007 files, which is not something that they figured out by going and ask, asking Microsoft for the code. It's something they had to figure out by reverse engineering how the Office file format works. Um, and as you can imagine, maybe that doesn't get you the most robust code when you spend all this time reverse engineering file formats and then putting that into your system. So the attack surface of forensic software is huge, and this needs to be understood when, we, when you kind of take our research into perspective. Um, because what we did was look at a very, 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 very small slice of the attack surface and found some interesting bugs. And my expectation is that there are many, many more bugs like the ones we ta were talking about all throughout these products 
that all you have to do is get as esoteric as you want to be able to find them. Um, go find something really weird. So let's classify what the bugs are against forensic software and what the impact is. Um, so evidence hiding is something that's been talked about before. This is kind of the standard anti-forensics thing, which is, can I perhaps create a file system that is interpreted by the operating system in a way that allows me to access data, but my, the forensic software doesn't see that data, right? Um, there's been a bunch of attacks like that, and these bugs get fixed. Um, I'm not talking about things like stenography or encrypted partitions, but we're just talking about, you know, can I do something funny that maybe Linux can deal with or Windows can deal with that guidance can't, that NCase can't or the, the sleuth kit can't? Um, so these bugs have been found before, they'll be found again. Um, they're just basically because it's, it's almost impossible to write a piece of software that looks at all these file systems the same way the operating system does. Um, and what is the impact of this? Well, it's obvious. If you can hide your evidence in plain view, uh, then maybe you get away with something, right? Um, code execution bugs. This is uh, of, of interest in, you know, in the Black Hat audience, people always want to see blood on the floor, right? And the blood on the floor they want to see is, is remote arbitrary command execution. Um, we are not claiming remote arbitrary command execution today. For all you reporters who are looking to misquote me, uh, please listen to that statement. We are not claiming remote command execution. What we are claiming is that we have found lots of memory corruption bugs. And it is an exercise to the reader to determine whether these memory corruption bugs can become exploitable or not. Um, because I've seen what happens when people go up on black hat stages and say they have an exploit and they can't produce it. Um, and say that that person is then, you know, attacked by a blog storm. Fortunately, uh, Guidance doesn't have the same people backing them up as Apple does. Um, so I'm guessing that I'm not going to have 10,000 blog messages about how I'm an idiot tonight. Um, but this is an important point, right? We're not claiming remote uh, arbitrary execution. What we're claiming is that there's lots of bugs. And odds are, when you find lots of bugs that cause memory corruption, somebody who spends enough time looking at it is going to be able to turn into an exploit. I, I certainly think that the evidence that we have supports the idea that people need to prepare for uh, remote command execution in forensic software uh, with co from code hidden within these hard drives that you, you grab, which is a totally uh, reasonable thing to prepare for. And I think some people that run forensic shops that we've talked to, like perhaps the FBI, uh, is thinking about this, and some people who, 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 who do, do not, right? Most people don't even think about this. Uh, and the excuse we hear all the time is our forensic workstation isn't hooked up to the network, so it really doesn't matter if you have arbitrary code execution. Right, so maybe you run on a VM and you reboot it. Because we all know that virtual machines are a perfect security barrier, right? <laughs> See other talks. And, and that's, that's a smart move. I, I, I'm not saying it's not a bad move. I'm just saying I don't think people, the reason people do stuff right now when they set up the forensic labs is not because they think there's malware running around inside the lab, right? It's to do things like they can set up a VM so they can say that nobody else has touched the machine since they last used it. So that's obviously a class of bugs that we're not going to talk about too much more, but people need to be aware of. Um, and then a kind of weird bug is denial of service. What happens if you can deny the ability of somebody to look at a hard drive with a certain piece of software? Now, the standard way, I mean, most good examiners would probably be able to figure out if they keep on opening up a hard drive in one program and it keeps on, their program keeps on crashing, that they're going to have to do something else. And it's highly unlikely that denial of service attacks would, over, would overlap with different products. Um, and so maybe this doesn't have an impact on people. Um, I, I certainly think it's something that can be worked around in a situation where you can't open up the whole hard drive. Where it gets interesting is if you can't view a single file, right? If you're an examiner and you've got 500 files on your de image files that you're looking at and you're paging through them and you look, you